All right, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Wachowski, and I'd like you to welcome you to the Heart of a Warrior podcast. I'm here with Dr. Greg Bagan, um, who's been a mentor in my life now for four years. Uh, he, he is the leader of Heart of a Warrior Ministries, and, and we just came to the realization of where men are at today and kind of the struggle that men have and the character of man, and we just started to see a downfall in just who God designed men to be. And so we decided to do these podcasts, and so we're really excited. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll get something from it, but we figured we'd start by, you know, just kind of explaining a little bit of how we got here. So, yeah. Dr. B, why, why don't you do that? Well, uh, you know, I'd, actually, Mike, I was just looking at the passage that, that uh, started it all. It's actually Romans chapter 2, verse 4, and it says this, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Hmm. Now, there's a whole backstory beyond, uh, uh, behind that that kind of moves into why Heart of a Warrior even started. But it goes back to the fact that I, I grew up in a Roman Catholic home and um, went to a parochial school. Um, and so I felt, you know, that I, I didn't need the gospel. Right. And so consequently, uh, when I married my wife, which was back in 1969, Debbie and I have been married now for 53 years. Um, but she thought I was a Christian because I said all of the right things. Okay. I never had a personal relationship with Christ. Um, I never even read the Bible. And so uh, her, her father was a, was a strong follower of Christ. And, you know, I always watched him because there was just something different about him. I remember walking into the house one time. I was visiting, um, actually my, my, my wife was at that time engaged to my best friend. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that didn't go well. No, uh, right. so, and, and so anyway, I came to look for him. And so I came in and, and I saw Doc Rabine and her dad, he had his head like this into his hands. I said, Doc, are you all right? And he says, I'm praying. I said, I didn't even think. I said, it's not supper time. <laughs> Because I'd never seen anybody pray in the house wow. except for, you know, a meal. Right. And so I knew, though, that I, th I think it was the Spirit of God who convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, kind of setting me up. Wow, okay. So it kind of clear up my powers of observation as I, I just started watching him and listening to him. Well, Debbie and I ended up getting married in 1969, and we were given a Bible. And first time I'd ever had my own Bible. You know, I've been to catechism class. I was an altar boy until I was benched for eating unblessed hosts and uh, in the cassock locker <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> for six months. <laughs> oh, but anyway, um, but I was always curious. I'm kind of the, the fool who asks more questions than a wise man can answer. So I'm asking questions, and I, I was curious. So I took it out of the tissue, and I started reading it. And for three weeks, I read probably three-quarters of it. Wow. But Mike, I'm living proof that God's word doesn't return void because it goes back to this passage. Now, move ahead a little bit. Um, just uh, Debbie and I, when we got married, as I said, I grew up in a French family where your major function was to carry on the family name. But Debbie and I experienced uh, the loss of four babies, four miscarriages. And just before I left for Vietnam, um, she became pregnant. So I went to Vietnam shaking my puny little fist in the face of God, thinking he was going to take this child too. Seven and a half months later, off the coast of Recife, Brazil, as we were heading back from Vietnam, I got a radio message that I had a baby girl. Debbie had given birth to our daughter, Monique, um, in South Miami. And uh, so I received this radio message. And so we pulled into Puerto Rico as we kept heading up the coast to refuel. And the captain released me. So I flew into Miami, rented a car. Drove to South Miami. My wife had no clue I was coming. Hmm. And I went up to the third floor when they didn't stop you like they do now. Right. Just as the nurse was carrying Monique out after a feeding. And I stopped the nurse. And I said, I want to hold my child. And Debbie, I could see Debbie beyond. It's the first time she had seen me in seven and a half months. And so I held my child. So six months later, we're in Key West, Florida. I was going to a special Navy school. And my wife had dragged me to a Baptist church twice because she was a follower of Christ. She actually came to Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. Okay. And, but I didn't think I needed the gospel because I belonged to the, my perception was I belonged to the privileged class. And so I didn't need it. And it didn't make sense to me anyway. 
So here I am, six months later, I walk into my daughter's room, and she's sound asleep, dark of the night, and I'm thinking, what a tremendous gift from God she is. Right. And thanking God, because we knew we couldn't have any more children, and this phrase might kept going through my mind several times, and it wasn't an audible voice, it was just this phrase, which was this verse, especially the second part of it, that God's kindness is meant to lead me to repentance. And all of a sudden, the gospel I had heard twice made crystal clear sense. Wow. And I knew what I had to do, that God had given me Jesus Christ as a tremendous gift for what he had accomplished on the cross. I understood the gospel, and so in the middle of the night, nobody around, my daughter sleeping, I dropped on my knees and gave my heart, body, and soul to Jesus Christ. This was in Key West, Florida. And almost instantaneous, now this was August 11, 1973. Okay. And uh, it's almost instantaneously, God placed men on my heart. Somehow I knew, Mike, intuitively, that if I got to the heart of a man, I'd get to the heart of the family. Right. So I didn't know any better. You know, I'm a brand new Christian. And so I decided to start a Bible study. He had, I had 26 guys in a special maintenance class in Key West, Florida, and I invited them all to my house for a Bible study. <laughs> Three of them showed up. And, and so guess what I taught on? Brand new Christian, Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth, Book of Revelation, oh, as a brand new Christian. And so I'm not advising that for, for everybody else, right. but I didn't know any better. Right. Over the course of several months, 17 of the 26 guys that were in that class ended up in that study. Wow. And many of them came to Christ. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I was just trusting God. Right. So, you know, you know, fast forward, I'd been discipling men. My wife would disciple women. I'd invite guys home from the Navy to stay in my home and, and share the gospel with them and, and talk about uh, the Bible and teach them from the Bible. And I was learning at the same time. I was just trying to stay ahead. Uh, you know, just one right. step ahead. Right, right. And so I was just trusting God for the results, and, and God honored that. Well, years passed, and I started to get this sense that some men got it, and other men didn't. Okay. And I knew this about men, that, you know, they were constantly turning the corner. You can only turn three corners before you're back in the same spot. So something was missing. So I just kind of turn up the burner you need to focus on the Word of God. You need to be disciplined. You need to be like a warrior. That's a single purpose in mind. And some guys rallied to that, it, turning up the burner, but some didn't. And I was, kept trying to figure out, what was I doing wrong? Well, go forward again. This is 19 now, what is it, 1991 or 19, yeah, 1991. I get called to the ministry of being the executive pastor of a large church in San Diego, a church of about 3,500. My actual title was staff coordinator and, and adult pastor, right. but in effect, it was to lead the, the staff. And so I noticed that young men were not getting into leadership positions in this church. Hmm. And I felt that that was, that was wrong. So I went to the senior pastor, and I, his name was Jerry. I said, Jerry, I want you to give me a mandate to go out in the congregation and find young men who have raw leadership skills. Let me put them under my wing. Then give me the authority to put them into positions of responsibility right. when I'm done, for them, done with them. And so um, he gave me the mandate. So I interviewed 33 men. Right. I only accepted 13. You know what it was based on? It was their body language. I didn't really care what they said because I know God could change that through the power of the Spirit, right. could correct their theology um, because it matters what you believe. Right. But I wanted to see if they had the right attitude okay. and the right demeanor. And so if they leaned forward, Mike, and there was some degree of anticipation in their eyes, they were in. I didn't care what they said. Wow. And if they leaned back with their arms folded like this and were looking away from me and not at me, I knew I would be spending all my time convincing them what the truth yeah, was. Right. So they were out. They were out. <laughs> so over the course of four years being there, over 40 men had gone through on this journey with me. And um, 
So I was discipling these for me. These were doctors, lawyers, Navy pilots, roofing contractors, Department of um, the Highway employees, and just men that just came in, in and out of, right. of the ministry. Now, right. the last thing I wanted to do was to start a ministry. As a matter of fact, I ran from it. But in any case, in the midst of that four years, I still had this nagging question about the X factor because some of these guys got it, some of them didn't. Right. Some of them were constantly repeating the same problem over and over again in their lives, the same sin. So um, one day, and this is, maybe this has happened to you, I know it has because we, we've had conversations about this. You know, you can read a passage over and over again but one day, for some reason, yeah. all of a sudden, it jumps out in right. bold relief like a neon light. Right. You had that happen, oh, yeah. right, Mike? Yeah. So what happened was, is that as I was disturbed over this whole issue about some men getting it and some men not getting it, I came across an ob what I felt at that time was an obscure passage, Proverbs 4.23, which says, Above all else, guard your heart, for from it comes the wellspring of your life. And I was stunned. And what that did for me as I looked into it, first of all, what that passage says, above all else, in other words, to make it your highest priority, right. number one responsibility, above all else, guard your heart, which means you have to be vigilant, never drop in your guard, standing on, on right. uh, your watch at the gate, protecting your loved ones, protecting your own heart. Above all else, guard your heart. For from it comes the wellspring of your life. So what I came to realize as I started to look into this concept or this metaphor of the heart um, is that um, it's, it talks about, uh, metaphorically again, your beliefs, your values, your attitudes, and your motives. Right. And so, you know, I, being you know compulsive as I am, um, I looked up, in the NIV at that time, all 805 passages on the heart. Only or some derivative. Huh? <laughs> and I studied because I wanted to understand what it what the what the Bible meant by the heart. Right. I found it interesting that when I looked up the word love, it was found seven hundred and some times. Which doesn't mean that just because heart is found more than love, right. it's a more important biblical concept. Right. But I think God's trying to tell us something right. if it's included that many times. I only found in three or four instances that it actually referred to um, the physical organ of the heart. Yeah. The rest of it was metaphorical, but they, it co coalesced around these four concepts of beliefs, values, attitudes, and motives. And the second thing I found out is there was a relationship between those four components. And it's not as linear as this because it's more like an ecosystem. Your central beliefs, what you truly believe at the core of your being, establishes your values, your values inform your worldview, your worldview conditions your motives, your motives energize your behavior, and your behavior will always reflect the health of your heart. Right. So the, I was on the wrong battlefield is what I found out with these men in the sense that I was constantly looking at sanctified behavior modification. If I could get their behavior to conform right. to certain acceptable standard, uh, which is kept in place by the fellowship we keep, the rules we obey, um, and, and other influences, that they would end up becoming the godly men that God called us to be. What that passage and, and passage related to the heart finally convinced me of is that the behavior will always reflect the health of the heart. Right. The behavior may be indicative of what's going on inside of there because there'll be trends and the first indication that there's something amiss in your heart right. is going to be your behavior. We could probably get into this much at a, at a different podcast right. in a greater detail, but let me just summarize how Heart of a Warrior came about. So when I started focusing on the internal issues, the components of the heart, beliefs, values, attitudes, and motives, I started to see God work in some powerful ways and transformational change in the lives of these men. Right. They were not the same men. Uh, they ended up developing, instead of moving, uh, being shotgun with their life, they ended up becoming a laser beam. Right. So in 1995, I was recruited to come back here to St. Paul to be the associate acad academic dean at Bethel Seminary here in St. Paul. And 
Um, I said this to the Lord at that time, Mike. I said, Father, I could do this again, but I wouldn't know if it was you or me. So I'm not going to tell anybody what I've done. Right. You'll have to convince me to do this again. Now, that was pretty brash of me. It was kind of like my own Gideon's fleece. Right. Well, six months later, um, I'm, I'm teaching it with a friend of mine, a Sunday school class at the First Baptist Church of White Bear, which ultimately became Eagle Brook. Okay. And, and so there was a class of about 100 people in there, uh, men and women. And probably about the fifth or the sixth time in, um, I gave them a definition of legacy. I said, legacy is the aroma left in the nostrils of those God's called us to influence long after you're gone. And I said, most of you men in here are going to leave a stench. Right. Come now, on. that's not how you would normally end a Sunday school lesson. That's a man to man, though. <laughs> but as, I, as the class completed and I walked out, a guy stopped me. Right. And he said, Dr. Borgon, he said, um, I have three men who are new in the Lord, but they've been very successful in business, but they're not getting what they need. Would you be interested in teaching a Bible study for us? And I said, absolutely not. Right. <laughs> and he was shocked and I said he said why not I said Mark that his name was Mark I said Mark um, I'm not going to give a Bible study that gives you an intellectual grasp of God's word without a commensurate change of your soul I said I know enough about men because I've been working with men for all these years up to that point that they've got stuff in the closet that needs to clean out and I said I'm not talking psycho babble or belly button gazing but I'm talking about stuff that holds them back right and I said you go back to these three men and if they're willing to clean out that closet, right. I'll give them my life. Right. One year later, he comes back. One year later, he had recruited nine men. And so for two and a half years in my home, I invested in them. Um, and it would ultimately became phase one, phase two, and phase three of Heart of a Warrior. And at the end of this two and a half years, and they were graduating, they had written their personal battle plans and, and so forth. Um, they had invited their wives to my home. Yeah. And um, I remember one of my analytical types who said to me, you ought to give us a master's degree for what you put us through. Yeah, I know. And he says, you forced us to think. You've been through it. You forced us to think. And I says, yeah, Ray, that's the problem is most men have forgotten how to think. Come on now. Yep. In a spiritual way. And so anyway... Um, these men brought their wives, and at that time, the senior pastor of the church was Bob Merritt. Um, and, of course, uh, a friend of mine, Erwin McManus, was uh, speaking at Promise Keepers. Another friend of mine, Gary Gonzalez, was the chief of staff of PK. So they were all in town. Mm -hmm. And Ray Villapani was the vice president of reconciliation at PK at that time. And all of them came to my home to witness this event. And I remember inviting Bob to come. And he, he says, well, he, I, because eight of the nine guys were from Eagle Brook. Right. And so he came. And in any case, these men got up and they started to sharing what God had done in their life. And there was almost not a dry eye right. in the house. And so when they were all done, um, and I wanted to release them in prayer. And Mark, the guy who originally got the group together, stopped me. And says, no, we're not done yet. He went out on the deck and he got this box. And in this box was a plastic shield, plastic sword, a plastic Roman helmet, a plastic shin guards. And he gave them to me. And at that time, one of the most popular movies was Gladiator. Come on. And they says, you're our General Maximus. You took us to places we wouldn't go by ourselves. And I, I was touched by that. Yeah, no kidding. A little embarrassed, but touched by it. And I wanted to release him in prayer again. He says, we're not done yet. So he went back out to the deck, brings in this four foot by four foot mahogany plaque. It had two swords on it, stainless steel swords, modeled after a Roman general sword circa 125 AD, and had engraved on the stainless steel blades how I signed my email at the time, in his strength on one side, to his honor on the other side. And then it had Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. And then it had all their names at the top. And by then I'm a blubbering idiot, right? Oh yeah, of course. Tearful. So they all leave, and my wife and I are sitting on the couch looking at this, leaning up against the fireplace. I said, honey, I don't know where I'm going to put this. I don't have an office big enough to put this. And she says, 
this is who you are, and this is who we are as a family. She says, I'm mounting it on the fireplace to this day. You've seen it. It's there. But, Mike, that was actually the official beginning of Heart of a Warrior. And I knew by that time I couldn't drag my heels any longer. I couldn't run from the ministry. Um, I came in kicking and screaming, but God won. And so now we've been in existence for over 27 years. And you're a recent graduate, and you've been with me for a while, and you have the heart of a warrior. And I have this one desire, Mike, to, when God calls me home, to bust through the gates of heaven, utterly exhausted, having expended everything on the field of engagement. Because, frankly, Mike, I'm sick and tired of men living lives of mediocrity. Right. And God has called them to live lives of significance. Right. And so, consequently, I'll give my life to that. So that's how it all started. Yeah, I, love <laughs> I love it, Dr. V. That's just amazing. Uh, you know, since I've known Dr. V, he's, I've gone through his classes, and I'm telling you, it is a master's degree, but I'm telling you, <laughs> It does something inside of you when you discover your personal mandate and your biblical mandate. All that work that you have us go through, you know, by the time, that's what I loved about it. By the time I was done, I was so clear. Like you say, laser pointed. I was laser pointed. I no longer was shotgun. I knew exactly what God called me to do, why he called me to do it. And so I just thank you for inviting me into the process. Because oh, I love it. It was an absolute pleasure. I love it. And... So that's a little bit, I mean, that's just a little bit about you. I've, there's so many more things in these podcasts. I'm sure we'll be tapping into yeah. all, all those things too. And, you know, how it started for me was um, I was, I had no religious background whatsoever. I, I was raised in a, a home that was pretty tough. Uh, mom and dad divorced when I was five, remarried, divorced. So a lot of that alcohol, just, you know, pretty messed up stuff. You know, it was hard. And, um, but we had no, I had no idea at church. I had no idea there was a God. I had no idea there was a Jesus. And, and so I basically, to get away from it all, I joined the military. You know, that's something similar we mm-hmm. both have. I joined the Air Force and went off into the Air Force and basically, you know, uh, partied. That's basically all I did. I lived in the house with four guys and drinking every day and just partying, partying my life away. And, uh, but then one thing happened that was pretty significant. I was at a bar and, uh, Drinking, I looked over and I saw this poufant, red hair, beautiful lady, you know, back in the poufant days, Bon Jovi <laughs> days, you know, and all those kind of, and so I thought, I'm going to go ask her to dance. So I went up and asked her to dance, and she said, she gave me kind of that up and down look, you know, and she said, if I wanted to dance with you, I would have asked. And I'm like, well, okay, that didn't work. So, <laughs> so I went back, drank another pitcher of beer, and got enough, got enough unction to go do it again. And I asked her, I said, come on, just one dance. And she said, okay. And she kind of danced like with her friends, not with me. I was on the dance floor. Yeah. And I, I was a good dancer. She probably will say differently. But I was, I was a good dancer. And I asked her for her phone number at the end of that. And uh, she gave me the wrong one, <laughs> purposely. So I thought, I'm going to find her the next day, and so I, uh, the next weekend. So I went out there to the same place the next Friday, and there she was. And I said, hey, you gave me the wrong number. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. And, and I said, uh, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to get the right one. I'd like to take you on a date. And she said, she said okay. So she gave me the right one. Called her, and uh, she said, why don't you come over to my house? This is when I was in Colorado in the Air Force. And, and I drove out to her house with a friend. That's how unconfident I was. I brought a friend on my first date. <laughs> And, um, and I was walking towards her house and her and her mom came out of the door and her, I found this out later. Her mom said, who's the blonde guy? And my, and my wife was like, oh, it's just a mercy date. I'm going to date him once and I'm dumping him. And, um, and she, and she said, no, that's the one you're going to marry. Really? Yeah. She said, that's the one you're going to marry. And Carrie's like, no way. I don't even, I like long haired rock and roll guys, you know, <laughs> and he's a short haired military guy. But I always tell people I wander over with my Polish charm, you know, and, um, <laughs> And we ended up getting married uh, by a justice of the peace. We never had a wedding. And um, we moved from Colorado back here to Minnesota after I got out of the Air Force. And she was pregnant where she was pregnant with my son when we moved here. I got a job as a mechanic and basically it was five days, five days a week. I was get to work at six, get done with work at six, go to the bar till midnight, two o'clock in the morning, come home drunk. I mean that was five days a week. Hmm. And uh, so finally after I'm surprised we surprised you still have a liver left. Uh, I'm surprised I have 
to have a lot of things left. Um, <laughs> but uh, so after after about two years, my son was now two, and um, and after about two years, we lived here in Minnesota, and she was done. Uh, she she was she actually started going back to church. She rededicated her life to Christ um, because she knew Jesus at a young age, and she rededicated her life to Christ. And um, she told the pastors at the time that she was going to divorce me. She couldn't handle it. She didn't know if I was coming home or not. Every time I came home, I'd come home drunk. So she, you know. And the pastor looked at her and said, no, you're not done with him yet. Who you see isn't really who he is. And you need to love him like God loves him unconditionally. And you need to find a scripture verse. And you need to hold on to that verse for him. So she got the scripture verse that he would be like a tree planted by living water that will produce much fruit. And I'd come home at 2 o'clock in the morning. She'd have dinner waiting for me. I'd try to fight with her. She'd rub my shoulders. Give me a massage. She wouldn't argue back. She wouldn't fight back. This went on for about six months. Hmm. And I'm telling you what, when somebody loves you when you don't deserve to be loved unconditionally, you don't have to tell them their sin. It, it gets revealed to you. And I just started to see how bad I was treating her. And I even said to her, I'm like, why do you love me? You, I treat you so bad. She said, because I know there's a plan for your life. Oh, F that plan. You know, there's no plan. There's no God, you know, whatever the case may be. Every Saturday night, she would ask me to church, and I wouldn't go. Finally, I went, hung over, <laughs> sitting there in a small little church, about 60 people. I'm in this church, and the pastor is, stands up there, and he's like, he starts preaching, and all of a sudden he stops and said, hey, there's somebody in this room right now. Your heart's beating out of your chest. And my heart was just bam, 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 beating out of your chest. And he said, uh, he said you need to come up here, because that's God knocking on your heartstrings. And I stood up. And I don't even know why, but I, I stood up and I look around and all these people, they're all crying. They're all crying. I'm like, what are they doing? What are they crying for? And I walked up to him and he said, do you know that there's a God who created the heavens and the earth? And I was like, nope. He said, well, there is. And that same God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And I said, he goes, do you know Jesus? I'm like, nope. And he went through the Romans Road gospel, just a simple gospel message to me about how Jesus died for my sins and how I could be brand new. I could be white as snow. And he said, do you know that you have sin in your life? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, do you want to have that cleaned out? And I'm like, sure. So he said, repeat after me. And so simple, asking Jesus into my heart, really quick, very simple. In Jesus' name, amen. And all of a sudden, all these people that were crying now are hugging me. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, because they've been praying for me for yeah. months, you know, that I didn't know about. Okay, that was weird. So I got went to work on Monday, went to the bar Monday night. Sat down at the bar, and all of a sudden I started hearing this. You need to go home. You need to go be with your wife and your son. And now my daughter who was born. I kept, you know, battling. I'm like, no, I don't want to go home. I want to sit at the bar. So a long story short from there, my boss came in. And after I had about three or four more beers, and my boss came in, and he was mad at me. I worked as a heavy equipment mechanic. And, and he said, we got in this argument. And he started, no, he goes to the bar seven days a week. And uh, we got into this argument. And uh, about raising kids. And I'm like, my kids are going to do great. They're going to not do drugs. They're, you know, and all that. He goes, you ain't going to have control over your kids. They're going to do what they want. And I'm like, what do you know about raising kids, man? I was like, you're, you're at work seven days a week, and then you're here at the bar till two in the morning. I said, you never see your kids. And I always say, you know, if God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through a donkey. <laughs> and basically, he said, yeah, look at you. You're doing the same thing. And I said, you're right. You'll never see me in here again. And I left. I'm driving home. And I'm just so excited. I'm driving home and I come into the house, I come into the apartment. I'm like, hey, Harry, Carrie, I'm never going back to the bar again. She's like, settle down, you're drunk. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm serious. I'm like, I'm like, I was sitting at the bar and I heard this voice say, you need to go home. She said, well, that was the Lord. I'm like, shut up. You can talk to him? And she's like, well, yeah. I'm like, how? Well, how what do I got to do to continue doing this? She goes, you got to read the Bible. You got to understand his word. You got to know his word and you'll know his voice. And I'm like, give me a Bible. I mean, I had no religious background to stop me from believing what was in there. And I just ate that thing up, Dr. Yeah. B. I mean, I just, you can lay hands on the sick and they recover. Let's go pray for people, you know. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, and I, and so the journey, that's where my Christianity began. But to kind of go into how I got here was I started going to church and I became a youth pastor and uh, uh, at this church and even the guy that, is filming us right now. It was back in that day, too. He was a teenage little rudded, rud headed, ruddy boy. No, but anyway, and um, <laughs> but he became one of my leaders in the youth ministry. And, and I just, I was just all up for God. I was just 100% all up for God. 
And so we did a thing called Boys to Men because just like you, my heart just kept going out to the young teenage guys. Yeah. And I kept seeing them. They just seemed like they were lost and whatever the case may be. And so uh, a guy named Randy Mitchell, who started the Boys to Men, um, asked me if I wanted to go on a, a retreat where he speaks off the movie Braveheart and does teaching off the cliffs. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm in. I'm all in. So he did that for about three years, and then he kind of christened me to kind of take it over because my heart was there. Every single mm-hmm. teenage guy I began to mentor, I began to disciple. That was when um, Wild That Heart first came out from um, uh, John Eldridge, and I took mm-hmm. him through that book, you know, and mentored him through that book. And and from that point forward, I've just seen a decline in the character of men. Yeah. Too many men leaving their families. Too many men abandoning their homes. Too many men, you know, their, their work ethic has changed. And... After about 10 years of doing this retreat called Boys to Men, we ended up changing it to Crucible. We called it Crucible. After about 10 to 12 years after do, of doing it and mentoring a bunch of men, I just began to realize that our world is going to go downhill really quick if we don't have men starting to step up to the plate. So I started doing weekend retreats with young men, mm-hmm. and I did it off the movie Gladiator, Braveheart, 300. We were soldiers. I created a whole bunch of leadership teachings off of there up the characteristic of men and and uh and it was making an effect and men's lives were being changed but in the last about five six years um basically when we we, i don't know if you've ever been on a low ropes course but Mm -hmm. i usually took guys in a low ropes course as a team building course and about 10 years ago maybe 12 i was taking i could usually take 60 guys six groups of 10 through eight things on the low ropes course in about five hours four hours I couldn't get one group through the first three because hmm. they didn't want to figure it out. They're like, this is stupid. They had no capacity to figure something out without the cell phone, yeah. without it getting figured out for themselves. And I literally said, you're not going anywhere until you accomplish this. You're not going to leave. So you'll sit here for all day. But the, the, the courage and the enthusiasm and the dreaming and all those things that men are supposed to do, the, the, the facing the battles and all that kind of stuff, I just began to see him go in the opposite direction. And that's about when I met you. And that's mm-hmm. about when my when uh, when a friend of mine that knew you said he started talking to me, I met him and um, and uh, and he's like, You gotta talk to Dr. B. He said, You guys have the same heart. Hmm. And he was right. And uh, and that's kind of where our journey began about four years ago and now we're stepping into these podcasts to just talk man to man about things that we see are happening in men today yeah and hopefully at the same time with you watching this that you'll get something from it just to help you be stronger as a man of god and that's yeah and, and for you, those of you that will be tuning in uh to these podcasts hopefully uh you will we're just going to be straight with you yeah. we're not going to beat around the bush we're just going to tell it like it is and so if you want to hear uh, exactly the way at least god has laid on our heart the way we see things and um, the counsel that he's going to be giving us through his word and has given us on how your journey could lead to something of significance yeah. where uh, your life will mean something, uh, have eternal consequence, then we really encourage you to tune in. Yeah. And so with that, I think we should end with what me and you always say when we leave each other. Strength and honor, brother. Strength and honor, sir.